Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. If you do like this channel, please like and subscribe and that all helps me to give you more value. Uh, here, as promised, are chapters 10 to 12 of A Christmas Cruise Murder. I hope you enjoy. Chapter 10. The ship was buzzing with excited passengers enjoying their Christmas break as Rachel made her way towards Creams feeling refreshed after sleeping for most of the time since her telephone call with Marjorie. She eyed the Christmas tree standing in all its glory in the atrium and the flocks of people exploring what was the main hub of the ship during the daytime. If only we could get this crime solved as quickly as possible, I can have some chill time. Work had been demanding since she'd become a detective constable and was likely to bring many more challenges when she got a DS post. There were few vacancies in London, so she and Carlos had agreed that she should apply to areas elsewhere, as he travelled the country anyway. But she wasn't keen to give up the luxurious flat Marjorie had invited her to inhabit in Knightsbridge, an area she truly loved. Nevertheless, it was looking more and more clear that the only way to get promotion was to move. There were numerous vacancies in the Midlands, so she had sent away applications and copies of her CV before leaving for the cruise. You look like you've got the world's troubles on your shoulders. Sarah arrived behind Rachel and put her arm around her. I was just thinking about jobs and what might be next for me. I think I'll end up in the Midlands. I remember that case you solved when you were at uni. Wasn't that in the Midlands? Gory business. Are you likely to end up in Leicester? Rachel smiled. I've been wondering that myself. I don't think D.I. Bond would be pleased if I ended up there, and I certainly wouldn't be keen to work for her. But who knows? Anyway, perhaps this case will keep me out of trouble and stop me worrying about the future. That's not like you to worry about the future. Your faith will keep you going whatever happens, it always does. You do still have a job, after all, Rachel nodded. You're right, it's all in hand, but I'd still like to know where I'm going. I want to be a proper detective. They both laughed as they found a table hidden in the corner of the quiet patisserie, where they would be able to speak without being overheard. Rachel looked round the room. There were just a handful of guests occupying tables nearer to the windows in the main area of the cafe. Sarah glanced through the menu, and Rachel felt guilty as her friend looked tired. How was surgery this morning? Relatively quiet, considering it's winter. There are a lot of coughs and colds going round already. The trouble is, people bring them on board, and then the viruses spread rapidly as they congregate in the busy passenger hubs not to mention through the air conditioning, or should I say heating system at this time of year. That too, but at least so far it appears to be a relatively mild virus. We don't want any flu going round, even if some people are convinced they've got the flu when they have a cold. Yes, we get that a lot at work. People always say they've got the flu, and they miraculously recover within a few days. My understanding of flu is that it lasts for longer than that, and usually knocks people off their feet. Oh, here's Jason. Both women looked up. Rachel loved the way Sarah's eyes lit up whenever Jason entered a room, and wondered if her own did the same when she saw Carlos. She suspected they did. She definitely still got flutters when she saw her fiancé. Jason joined them at the table, clearly resisting the temptation to kiss Sarah in a passenger area but the affection in his eyes said it all. Hello, you two. How has your day been? Sarah repeated the news she had just given Rachel about a relatively quiet surgery and coughs and colds. Brigitte's on call now, and I'm on tonight after we've had dinner with my parents. I take it you're still coming? Jason nodded before looking at Rachel and giving her time to respond to his initial question. Mine is a lot better now I've had a sleep. I forget how tiring night shifts are when you stop them. She didn't mention breakfast, as Jason knew she had been in the club restaurant earlier in the day. 
He too looked tired. It looks like you haven't been to bed yet, though. He looked sheepishly towards Sarah, who was about to scold him. Sorry, not yet, it's been full on. But I'm going to grab a couple of hours when we're finished here, so I'll be fresh for tonight, don't worry. He looked up as one of the waiters appeared. Cream scones with all the trimmings and a cappuccino, please, Henri. Yes, sir. Ladies? I'll have a blueberry muffin and tea, please, Sarah answered. Coffee and cheesecake for me. The waiter went away to gather their orders together, and they chatted amicably until he returned. Once the food and drink was in front of them, Jason coughed to bring them to attention. <coughs> <coughs> you sounded just like Waverley then, laughed Rachel. Jason laughed too. <laughs> they say you get like the people you work with. Don't you dare. I like you just as you are. Waverley is fine, but he is not Jason Goodrich. Sarah beamed at him. Don't worry, I'm still here. He gazed at the adoring eyes looking at him across the table. Uh, um, if you two lovebirds would concentrate for a while, we have an investigation to discuss. Jason pulled himself away from the eye lock and moved his empty plate, having stuffed two scones down in a matter of minutes, while still managing to flirt with Sarah. Rachel suspected he hadn't had time to eat all day. He removed a tablet from a document holder that he had placed on the floor when he came in. Okay, Rachel, first tell us what you found out in the restaurant this morning. Rachel relayed her conversations with Pash, Sasha, and Mishka and their behavior. I think Mishka would have said a lot more, but Pash was hanging around and called him away. In fact, Pash was decidedly twitchy when I mentioned I knew you and Sarah. Yes, I was hoping he wouldn't catch on to that, but as we'd already eaten in there last night, I'm sure he would have remembered sooner rather than later. He's friendly enough most of the time, and polite, but he does seem to have issues with authority. It could be as simple as that. No wonder he didn't like his ex-boss. There was no one more authoritarian than Sosa, said Sarah. Jason looked down at the tablet and pulled up his interview notes. He says he was in the restaurant at the time of Souza's death. Claudia Kitiver and the galley records confirmed that the meal was delivered at 5 p.m. The waiters didn't go on duty until 5.30 p.m., so we do have a half-hour gap in all their alibis, which doesn't help. We have to assume that the food was replaced or intercepted between 4.45 p.m. and 5 p.m. Claudia had two trays to deliver, the first to a passenger on the next floor up. She left Souza's tray on a trolley in the crew-only room on that floor for no more than five minutes. We assume that if there was interference, it happened at that time, or when the bread was waiting for the hot food to be added to the tray in the galley. He pulled out the galley delivery log. That gap is a little longer, around ten minutes. Was Brenda there all that time? No, by chance or by design, I can't confirm which. She left the gully to attend to a cut finger as per health and safety rules. She had to locate a finger dressing from the first aid box. What do you mean by design? asked Sarah, open-mouthed. You can't think she would tamper with the bread? I'm trying not to think anything. I have to investigate objectively. Waverley told me just as much this morning. He says I have to follow procedure to the letter. Including keeping him up to date against the express instructions of your captain, you mean? Rachel teased. Thanks for telling him about the Brenda note. Sorry. He looked down at the table. Sarah nudged Rachel. It seems I'm out of the loop here. You mean... Jason told Waverley, turning to him. You promised. I did no such thing. Anyway, the boss looked so distraught this morning and desperately wanted to be kept informed. If I hadn't told him, we would have lost trust, and trust is everything in this job. Rachel understands that. Rachel smiled and nodded. I do. And on that note, 
Sarah and I have a confession to make. But for now, go on. What else did Pash have to say? Jason winked meekly at Sarah, checking she understood why he'd broken confidence. Seemingly satisfied that her grin confirmed she did, he continued. At first he was evasive, trying to pretend he liked his boss. But once I got firm and told him if he was lying to me it would look bad and his chances of promotion would be out the window, he became more forthcoming. He confirmed he didn't like Stefan Soza, saying that none of the waiters did. The boss nitpicked everything they did, always looking out for mistakes and embarrassing them in front of passengers. He says the staff were always nervous around Soza, and that made them clumsy. Two waiters have managed to get transfers up to the buffet, so there were two new starters on boarding day. I've discounted them from the investigation. He also said that he always arrived early at the restaurant before Sosa, so that he wouldn't be accused of slacking. He swears he was there at 5 p.m. Can anyone confirm that? asked Rachel. No, the others don't arrive until 5.30ish, but they confirm that Pash was there before them, and that he is always early to work. Isha Prostakov and Sasha Voronin said they hated their boss, but not enough to want him dead. They seemed to think Sosa had something over the wine waitress, Danielle. She insists there was nothing, and the others were just jealous, and that she got on well with the man. She wouldn't butch, even when I told her if there had been something, she could tell me now and that he could no longer do her any harm. She blamed Pash for her boss's behavior. According to her, Pash was after the top job and went out of his way to make the others dislike Sosa, frequently sabotaging the smooth running of the restaurant. My, my, a nest of vipers by the sounds of it, said Rachel thoughtfully. Do you think there's any truth in what the two men say? We do know he was violent towards women. Perhaps Danielle was afraid of him. There's more to it than that, I think, otherwise she would tell me now. It's not always that easy to admit to, and we can't rule her out of the equation. Jason nodded. What about their backgrounds? Rachel quizzed. Nothing untoward, they're all who they say they are. No criminal records came up in their pre-employment checks. Danielle Barcelos has a daughter who lives with her mother in Portugal. It seems she got pregnant on board ship a few years before my time. The child is now seven years old. Rachel straightened up immediately. How long has Sosa been working on this ship? Twelve years. I see what you're getting at. You think he might be the father? There's no way of knowing that unless Daniel admits to it. I could check her medical records to see if the father was named at the time of the pregnancy suggested Sarah. It will be on file, but unless it's relevant to the investigation, I don't think we will be able to breach confidentiality. We'll hold fire on that one. Perhaps you could ask her socially. I don't really know her, but Bernard knows everyone, so he might already be in the loop. He would have been on board at that time, I'll ask him. I assume you believe the kitchen maid? Claudia Kitova? asked Rachel. Yes, I do. She's a hard-working galley attendant. Been with the cruise line for ten years on and off. Brenda is adamant. She would have neither the will nor the brains to tamper with food in this way. Here's where the plot thickens, though. Rachel and Sarah shifted in their seats, eyes focused on Jason. I've been through the passenger manifest and it seems there are guests on board that were known to Sosa. Now that is interesting. Who? asked Rachel. His sister and brother-in-law joined the ship yesterday. That is a little too coincidental. Have you interviewed them? No, we didn't know they were on board until we went through an address book that was retrieved from Sosa's room this morning. It was a chance, really. I asked Ravanos to throw all the names in the address book through our computer to see if there were any passenger matches and was as surprised as anyone to find there were. 
Rachel and Sarah exchanged glances. What aren't you two telling me? Why do I think you already knew about the address book? Sorry, that's part of the confession, but go on for now, Rachel encouraged. Their names are Stella and Paolo Gonzalez, and they seemingly don't even know Sosa's dead yet. I'm waiting to see if they go to guest services and ask about him. If they don't, that would seem very suspicious, wouldn't it? That's not very kind. What if they have nothing to do with this? They have a right to know, Jason. Jason looked at Sarah. I'm sorry, love, but I think it's odd they haven't already made inquiries. I promise if they haven't by tomorrow morning, I'll ask Dr. Bentley to see them. Jason turned to Rachel. Anticipating what he was going to say, she prompted him. There's more, isn't there? He grimaced clearly still smarting from Sarah's rebuke. Brenda and Christine's father is on board, Rachel groaned. You think he might have come to seek revenge on behalf of his daughter? Does Brenda know? She does now. She's terrified he might be involved. It's a complete and utter mess. But I don't know how it could have been a passenger. They would have needed to know that Sosa had ordered food. And if my theory is correct, they would have had to move the EpiPens before he ate and replace them afterwards. I take it you didn't move the pens? No, Waverly was there first. I didn't look in the drawer. But how do you know about the pens and why do you think they were moved? I'm coming to that. You're right, though. I think we should stay focused on the crew for now. Rachel wasn't sure at all, but they had to start somewhere, and the suspect list was growing out of control. I agree, but I would suggest you try to befriend the couple and Brenda's father just in case. How am I supposed to do that? How oh, you always do it, Rachel, with that innate charm that comes from being a vicar's daughter, Sarah laughed. You could have put that a bit nicer. Rachel quipped back. Now, now, ladies, I hope I'm not going to have to separate you two. Jason joined in with their banter. Rachel and Sarah couldn't be closer. They were best friends forever. Sarah thumped his arm. I'd like to see you try. Are you happy to keep up with eating in the club restaurant, Rachel? Jason asked. You can take mum and dad with you tomorrow, added Sarah. That'll give you a cover. I'm taking them for dinner with the officers tonight. You two are invited, but we can do the same again in a few days' time, which means Jason can get some proper sleep. Okay, I can do that. In fact, it would be my pleasure. Rachel had known the Bradshaws most of her life growing up in the same village. They attended the church where her father presided, and she and Sarah had been at school together before going to the same university in Leeds and later sharing a flat. For tonight, though, I'll just head up to the buffet, have a quick meal and an early night. Lack of sleep has caught up on me. Shall we meet up in the jazz bar tomorrow night around nine? Suggested Sarah. Sounds good to me, said Jason. But before I go, what about this confession? I'm not being evasive, but can I tell you tomorrow? You've likely guessed right. We went to take a look in Sosa's room in the early hours. My fault, not Sarah's. I found some notes and photos, but have only managed to skim through the first few, as Waverley had costed me after breakfast, and I've slept on and off ever since. I'll go and check through them now, and hand them over tomorrow, unless I find anything urgent. Is that okay with you? That's fine. I trust you. Now, I too need to get some sleep. Me three before evening surgery agreed Sarah. I'll meet you in the jazz bar tomorrow, Rachel. If I'm late, you'll know I've been called to attend someone. They left creams together, and Rachel discreetly left the couple to walk away to say their goodbyes in private. She kicked herself for forgetting to mention Marjorie's concerns about the Macaulays, but Jason was clearly tired and had reached his limit for today, as had she. There was always tomorrow. 
Chapter 11 The day had flown past with activities she'd booked prior to the cruise to keep her occupied on sea days. She had avoided the club restaurant throughout the day to give her brain a rest and to lull the staff working there into feeling secure. But Rachel and the Bradshaws were in there now, enjoying a pleasant evening meal. Mary Bradshaw chatted to Rachel like she was a second daughter and cajoled her into eating more than she would have liked to. There had been little opportunity to speak to any of the waiters in any respect other than when they were ordering food as the restaurant was heaving. Passengers had obviously discovered the haven and were flocking in. Pash told them they would need to book in early if they wished to eat there after today. He said it with a smile, but Rachel detected a slight irritation whenever he looked at her. In his eyes, she was clearly Jason's spy, so he had good reason to avoid her. Then again, if he had nothing to hide, he wouldn't need to. When people behaved suspiciously, there was always something going on, experience told her, and the more he kept her at arm's length, the more she determined to find out what it was. Rachel, you're miles away again, Mary chided. You were just the same as a child, always thinking about something else, and now I expect you're missing your Carlos. Rachel sat bolt upright, feeling guilty on both counts. Yes, she had been miles away, but no, she wasn't thinking about Carlos. Poor Carlos, how does he put up with me? Sorry. That's all right, dear. I was just asking if you were ready. Gilbert and I are going to the show. Rachel finished the dregs of the after-dinner coffee she was drinking and picked up her handbag. I'm ready. Tell Sarah we'll see her at 10 a.m. tomorrow, would you? She's got the whole day off. I will. Does she know where? You've forgotten, haven't you? Really, Rachel? We arrive in Lisbon tomorrow and have booked on the tour to Fatima. You're coming too, unless your amnesia gets any worse. I'm beginning to worry about you. Are you sure everything is all right? Yes, of course. Sorry, I only finished nights the day before yesterday. Not quite with it yet. She smiled sheepishly, and Gilbert winked to let her know he understood. The Bradshaws kissed her on the cheek, and she left them to book a table for an early breakfast while she made her way towards the jazz bar. The public areas were busy with people heading towards the Coral Restaurant for dinner or to the theatre. It was too early for her meeting with Sarah and Jason, but she might as well find a table and order a drink while she waited. At this time in the evening, the majority of passengers were in either of the main hubs, so the jazz bar was a little less busy. A barman who recognized her from previous sailings nodded an acknowledgement. Rachel found a booth away from the main jazz band, which afforded a little more privacy than the other parts of the bar. Having settled in, she people-watched while waiting for the others, a hobby of hers and one that was useful in the day job. Another barman bought her a martini and lemonade. I haven't ordered yet. How did you know? I was told to bring it to you, miss. Surprise! Bernard jumped up from behind the high seat where she was sitting. He placed a beer on the table and sat opposite, grinning from ear to ear. Thank you, Bernard. It's lovely to see you. She liked the mischievous Filipino nurse. Sarah said to tell you she'll be along soon. She's just finishing up with the lady who cut her shin. I expect she drank too much. You know how it is. How is the most beautiful passenger on board the Coral Queen? I don't know. I haven't seen her, she bantered back. They both laughed. Bernard was one of the few men who complimented her beauty without any ulterior motive. So she didn't retort with her usual caustic responses when he brought the subject up. Ha, got me. It's good to have you on board, Rachel. Things are always so much more interesting when you're around. I really don't know what you're talking about. He was about to explain, but saw the twinkle in her eye. Got me again. It's time you stopped allowing people to die on your watch, if you ask me. Ooh, now that hurts. If you don't behave, I won't tell you what I found out. 
Rachel straightened up and lowered her voice. Now you've got me. Is it something to do with Stefan Sosa? He beamed, but before he got to tell her, Jason arrived, followed almost immediately by Sarah. Jason's gaze was alert. He had shaved away the shadow from the day before and now cut a handsome figure in his freshly pressed uniform. He sat next to Rachel while Sarah joined Bernard on the bench opposite. Sarah also appeared to have caught up enough on her sleep to present herself in a favorable light, at least from where Rachel was sitting. Sorry we're late, I had to see to a passenger and Jason had to convince Waverley to stay away from us. Rachel gave Jason a sympathetic glance. It can't be easy for him when he's usually running the show, and now things are personal. Jason let out a deep breath. <sighs> I can't say I'm finding the situation easy either. I want him to be back in charge. Rachel believed him. She knew of Jason's loyalty to his boss and the respect he had for Waverley. It was a difficult scenario all round and a bit surreal. This time she was investigating with the chief's permission, not something he would usually have entertained. They needed to get to the bottom of this case. Anything more from the coroner? She asked. Just what we knew already, but Waverley is getting frustrated that the PM hasn't been done yet. Two days after the event. The coroner doesn't seem to be in any rush, thinks it's a clear cut case. If it is, he will most likely recommend health and safety procedures are tightened up. Usually I would be pleased, but with the finger pointing at a mistake by Brenda, it's not looking good, and it's only a matter of time before her link to the dead man is discovered outside our small circle, and we have to submit the evidence. Then it's more likely to be a murder investigation. Captain Jensen's giving Brenda the benefit of the doubt, but I don't know what he'll do if he finds out about the note. It is already looking like murder, said Rachel. Yes, but no one else knows that yet, not even the crew. Well, that might work in our favor because the killer will think they're off the hook and will be happy for the kitchen staff to take the blame for an apparent accident. Does anyone want to know what I found out? asked Bernard. All eyes moved towards the small man with the jolly face. Jason raised his eyebrows, encouraging him to speak. Enlighten us. I managed to have a chat with Danielle, the wine waitress. I know her from the crew bar where I hang out sometimes, mainly to keep an eye on their drinking and behavior. I try to work out which of them is likely to get the sack or end up in a medical center. Alcohol intake by crew was a cause for concern, as many of them would take their free time to extremes. Work hard, play hard was how they excuse the behavior, but it could lead to fights unprotected sex, and alcohol addiction. The medical team did their best to encourage fun while explaining the dangers of excess, but they were fighting a losing battle when it came to the crew bars, where the young enjoyed freedom and a bit of spending money for perhaps the first time in their lives. The older crew members also drank heavily at times, some of them behaving like predators taking advantage of the inebriated youngsters while others were more like parents protecting the young. I found her this afternoon by the crew pool. It was freezing out there, so there was no one else around. Sarah asked me to chat to her, but this was an unexpected encounter. Rachel wondered what Bernard had been doing out there, but Sarah got the question in first. Why were you out there then? I like to get some fresh air away from passengers sometimes, and it's one of the few areas where I can take a brisk walk without having to be polite. Anyway, she was sitting on a poolside chair in the pouring rain, drenched. The pool has been drained for the winter, but the hot tubs are still in use, so some of the crew mess around in them, but not today. I warned her she would catch a chill, and reminded her she had not had a flu jab yet. Bernard's our secret weapon when it comes to flu vaccine non-responders, explained Sarah. He knows everyone and has the memory of an elephant. Bernard smiled at the compliment. Anyway, she said she hadn't got around to it and would come along to morning surgery tomorrow to see me. I've booked her in. 
he beamed while Jason shuffled, impatient to find out what Bernard had to tell them. Then she explained that the death of Stefan Souza had surprised her, and she asked me what he died from. I explained I wasn't able to say and said I was sorry for her, that it must be hard to lose a colleague. You mean you didn't come out with some inappropriate joke? That's a first, teased Sarah. I can be sensitive sometimes, you know. He stuck out his chin and continued. She said she wasn't upset, just surprised. Then it slipped out that she had actually been relieved when she'd heard. And finally, she started to cry. I gave her my handkerchief, the one with my initials on, and waited patiently for her to carry on. Like we are now, said Jason. Sorry, to cut down a long story short, Rachel smiled. Bernard occasionally got British idioms muddled. Soon after she joined the ship, Souza seduced her when she had drunk too much whiskey. He promised her all sorts of favoritism which never materialized, and they had a brief relationship. I never suspected there was something going on with her back then. When she got pregnant, she wouldn't say who the father was, and we all assumed it was one of those one-night stands, and she probably couldn't or didn't want to remember. The relationship was kept hush-hush at Sosa's request, and ended after he punched her in the stomach one night after a row. Jason's fists clenched at this point, and Sarah gasped. She could have lost the baby. That's why she ended it. She told him that she would report him if he ever came near her again. And she also told him the baby wasn't his, although it was. As soon as the child was born, a girl, delivered in her hometown in Portugal, she decided that in order to protect herself and her daughter, she would be better off leaving the child with her mother. Later, she rejoined the coral and has been sending money home ever since. But around six months ago, she explained, Sosa had started to threaten her with DNA tests and told her he had a right to see his only child. Horrible man, Rachel exclaimed. I suppose he neglected to tell her he already had a son. He kept the ex-wife secret and told Danielle that unless she slipped him the old bottle of wine, he would challenge paternity and request access through a lawyer. Told her he would argue she was an unfit mother. Through fear, she did as he demanded. Afterwards, he told her that she was now a thief, and unless she wanted reporting, she was to do his bidding. That's evil. I never liked him, but had no idea he was this low. What bidding? asked Sarah. Favors. She had to keep tabs on the waiters and report what they were saying. So she gave him information that she could glean to convince him that she was doing what he demanded. Some things she kept back. Did these favors include sex? Rachel asked, not really wanting to know the answer, but it was necessary for motive. No, apparently he tried to make it part of the deal, but she said she would rather get the sack or throw herself overboard than let him come near her again. Good for her, said Sarah. It seems he let that one drop, knowing the line had been drawn. I believe her as she is mortified at the crimes she has committed for him, and said she was glad to finally get it off her chest. It was her daughter she was protecting, not herself. She even gave me permission to report her. You're not gonna do anything, are you, Jason? Sarah pleaded. Jason thought for a few minutes, scowling into his lemonade glass while clenching and unclenching his fists. Rachel knew the feeling. He was battling between rage against the dreadful man and his conscience. They let him ponder until finally he looked softly at Sarah. I will have to have a word with her. But it will be a gentle warning, I promise. She was coerced, so I don't feel the need to come down too heavily over this. Sarah placed her hand thankfully on his. But she is now a suspect in a murder investigation, said Rachel quietly. 
Yes, I'm afraid she is, agreed Jason. Well, I don't believe she did it, said Sarah angrily. And I hate to say this, but that man got what was coming to him. Sarah, Bernard exclaimed, that's something I would say, but not you. I'm sorry, that was horrible, wasn't it? Jason squeezed her hand. He was a brute, Sarah. We won't be shedding any tears, but we still need to find his killer and clear Brenda's name. Sarah nodded. Did Daniel say anything else? No, she was shivering, so I took her inside to get warm and left her in the crew cafe to get something hot to drink. Would you like to join me when I speak to her, Bernard? Perhaps that way she might tell us if she did actually hear any suggestion of a murder plot coming from the other waiters. You never know, she might have heard something. Bernard nodded. No problem. I don't think she's the killer, because she wouldn't have told Bernard all this if she was. She'd just be glad to be rid of the man. I expect she's wrestling with guilt about feeling pleased he's dead more than anything else. And she will have alienated her colleagues if they suspect she was spying on them, which it sounds like they did, from what they told you yesterday morning, Jason added Rachel. Why don't we speak with her in surgery tomorrow morning, said Bernard. That way it will be less threatening and I'll be able to see if she's forgiven me for telling you. With a plan in place, they decided to call it a night. Rachel made her way back to her stateroom, feeling angry about what she'd heard. Was there no end to what some people would do to get their own way? Chapter 12 Rachel slept in until 8 a.m., having gone out like a light as soon as she got to her room the night before. The moment she came to consciousness, the investigation was at the forefront of her brain. She slapped her head at still not having mentioned anything about the Macaulays to Jason or Sarah, and wondered if she should call Waverley before going on her trip today. Deciding against it, she reassured herself that it was unlikely that any harm would come to them while the ship was in port. If there was a plan to murder them, it would be done during sea days, and she suspected that to avoid much of a chance for investigation, it would happen on the return journey after the visit to the Canary Islands. She would gamble that she was right and discuss it with Jason or Waverley well before then. Having parked that worry, she got ready to meet Sarah and her parents in the main atrium before they went ashore for the tour to Fatima. It wouldn't have been her choice, but Mary Bradshaw was fascinated by spiritual places, and Rachel was happy to go anywhere, as long as it involved land and hopefully a long walk. She was missing her exercise routine. Mary and Gilbert Bradshaw were already standing among a crowd, waiting for Rachel and Sarah to arrive. Rachel heard running behind her and turned to see Sarah rushing. Is something the matter? Sarah panted and stooped to catch her breath. I thought I was late. What time is it? Quarter to ten. We've got fifteen minutes. But last this watch, Sarah glared at her wrist. It's gaining time again. I thought it was fixed. Rachel knew about the watch problems as her friend had mentioned it on the phone a few weeks before the trip. It was an old favorite watch that Sarah clung on to. Rachel also knew that the Bradshaws had purchased a solar charging watch for their daughter for Christmas, because they had discussed presents prior to the cruise so as not to overlap. Sarah was a keen advocate of environmentally friendly living as much as she could be, and tried hard to reduce her carbon footprint, as did Rachel. Well, that's it, you're going to be confined to my memory box. Sarah spoke to the watch, much to Rachel's amusement and Mary Bradshaw's horror. Sarah, I do wonder about you sometimes, then without pausing for breath. Good to see you made it, Rachel. We weren't sure you would remember, were we, Gilbert? It was never in doubt, answered her husband. Don't be a tease, Mary. Rachel was certain it hadn't been teasing, but she laughed anyway. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Let's get going then. People are boarding the coach. Sarah stuck her tongue out behind her mother's back, and Rachel nudged her. 
I hope you're not going to be childish today. Only if I'm treated like one. The happy foursome boarded the coach, and Sarah turned to wave to Jason, who was checking passengers off the ship through security. He looked up at the right moment and nodded. Security personnel had to concentrate on the cards they were scanning and check the photos of passengers exiting and entering the ship. Rachel noticed the early birds who had been off as soon as people were allowed to do so, already returning to the ship. Some would probably have lunch and then go ashore again. She kicked herself to concentrate on where she was as they found seats towards the rear of the coach. She didn't want another lecture from Mary about being elsewhere. Sarah sat in the aisle seat so that Rachel could look out of the window during the tour. Mary and Gilbert sat behind them as Rachel recognized voices coming from the seats in front and across the aisle. She nudged Sarah and tilted her head. Sarah rolled her eyes and groaned before whispering, Leave it today. There was no way Rachel would do that, and her friend knew it. So she raised her eyebrows in a mock, leave what, fashion, and got a dig in the ribs for her trouble. Mishka was sitting in the seat in front of Rachel, and Sasha in front of Sarah. Danielle, who had either missed her appointment with Bernard, and therefore with Jason, or been to surgery earlier, was sitting across the aisle from the men, next to someone Rachel couldn't see without craning her neck. But it was a woman, not a man. Pash wasn't there. The coach left the dockside, and soon afterwards the tour guide introduced herself and began a short history of Lisbon, pointing out various landmarks as they headed out of the city. Mishka and Sasha were not paying any attention as they had likely heard it all before, so Rachel listened to them instead. Her friend had been to Lisbon on numerous occasions, but never to Fatima, so Sarah was clearly concentrating on the commentary. At first, the men in front spoke in English about how much some crew members, whose names Rachel didn't recognize, had drunk the night before. Once they tired of that conversation, they moved on to the subject of work, and Rachel's ears pricked up as she leaned forwards, pretending to look out of the window. She was disappointed, as they almost immediately switched to Russian, and their tone became more serious. The only thing she could make out was the Russian word for death, and the name of Sosa. Gutted she hadn't continued her study of Russian, she resigned herself to sitting back in her seat with a sigh. Sarah raised her eyebrows. Serves you right, she said happily. Rachel drifted in and out of sleep on the journey until she heard the guide relating the story of the three shepherd children who had seen a vision of the Virgin Mary on multiple occasions over several days in 1917. The apparitions had been approved by the Vatican, and the site had become a Catholic pilgrimage since then. They would see a modern basilica called Our Lady of Fatima and the Chapel of Apparitions. It wasn't a site where miracles had occurred as some sites were, but one that held spiritual significance for Roman Catholics. Rachel was interested in history, as her degree had been in the subject, so she paid attention to the story. The guide ended her talk by telling them that two of the children had died during the influenza pandemic following the First World War, and that the third had become a nun. Fascinating, said Sarah once the guide stopped talking. I read a few books about flu pandemics recently. I love medical history. We're always living in fear of the next one. Rachel nodded. Swine flu didn't turn out to be the pandemic, did it? No, it didn't, but one mutation will be all it takes, and huge swathes of the world's population could be taken out in a matter of months, or even weeks due to modern travel. I'm pleased to hear you two having such a positive conversation, Gilbert Bradshaw's voice cut in. Sorry, Dad, I can't help it. That World War I pandemic was awful, you know. It killed more people than the war. Some estimates suggest over 50 million people worldwide. At the time, people were so pleased the so-called war to end all wars was over, it didn't get as much coverage as it would have if the government hadn't been so keen to raise morale. 
nurses and doctors were the heroes, putting themselves in harm's way, caring for the sick. Many of them died. I think that's quite enough of that subject, Sarah, please. Your father and I would like to enjoy a spiritually uplifting visit, not a health lecture, if you don't mind. Sorry. It was a bit depressing, but you can tell me more about it another time. Better still, recommend the book. Sarah smiled. You're right. Sorry, Mum. The coach drew to a halt, and passengers started to alight. Rachel was nudging Sarah to move so that she could be close to the restaurant staff, but her friend decided to be obtuse and wouldn't budge. If I have to stop talking about medicine, you can certainly stop chasing murderers, she whispered. What are you whispering about? I was just saying to Rachel how good it was she could forget about work for a while. The girl's guffaws drew a look of consternation from Mary, while Gilbert merely shrugged his shoulders. There, happy Mary, come on, let's get you into that basilica before it starts to rain. Rachel and Sarah managed to get away from the crowds of pilgrims to grab a hot coffee from a cafe. As luck would have it, Mishka and Sasha joined them. Are you enjoying day out, nurse? Sasha asked. Please, call me Sarah. I'm out of uniform, so forget about the nurse bit for today. Okay, Sarah. This is my friend Rachel. You've seen her dining with me and my parents. Delighted, Rachel. We have met, but not properly. I am Sasha, and this is Mishka. Sasha seemed pleased to talk, and if Rachel had to tolerate a small degree of flirtation, she decided it was all in a good cause. Do join us. Are you enjoying the visit? I would enjoy it more if it were not so cold, but we are Catholic, so a good place to pay our respects to Our Lady. The shrine was beautiful. Mishka's eyes watered as he recounted his experience. Sasha thinks I'm foolish, but I felt her presence. Enough of that man. Can't you just keep these things to yourself? No one likes to talk religion. I'm sure Sarah and Rachel would rather enjoy sensible conversation. We are in a spiritual place, so it's okay. I'm pleased you had an experience, Mishka, said Sarah, always one to defend the underdog, tapping his arm. What about you, Rachel? How are you enjoying your cruise? Sasha chose to move away from the topic his friend had started, and they ended up having two conversations, Sarah with Mishka and Rachel with Sasha. I'm enjoying it so far. Such a shame about your boss, though. I was only speaking to him on the way down to Southampton. It makes one think, doesn't it? Sasha looked disappointed that his charm wasn't having the desired effect, and frowned. Does it's always sad, but in our case of our boss, I hope you don't mind me saying, but he was a bad man. You will find it hard to discover anyone who is sorry about his passing. He must have had some good points. Sasha's scowl answered the question for her. I fear not. Mish couldn't stand him. He was always giving him trouble. Bash, he is now boss, also hated him. Sosa bullied people, men and women. But I hear he was extra cruel to women. So be pleased you didn't know him well. Sasha and Mishka had stopped talking and Mishka looked angry. The world is a better place without that man. He caused trouble wherever he went. It's good he died. I was often tempted to feed him nuts. We all knew about his allergy. Mishka roared with laughter. Sarah was astonished. One minute you're telling me about your religious experience, and in the next breath you were joking about the death of another human being. Mishka looked devastated. I apologize. I should not have been disrespectful, but that man did not deserve to live. I would never have done what I said. It was joking poor taste. They finished up their drinks, and as Mary and Gilbert joined them, the two men excused themselves. The Bradshaws and Rachel were happy to get back on the coach, having enjoyed the visit. But everywhere had been just a little too cold. Rachel and Sarah had been scolded by Mary for not bringing warm coats. Rachel acknowledged their error, but Sarah saw it as nagging and reacted accordingly. Peace had been restored, 
only when Mary told Sarah how much she liked Jason. The journey back to the ship was pleasant. Rachel felt rejuvenated having caught up on her sleep and been out in the bracing cold wind. Mary and Gilbert appeared to have enjoyed the visit, with Mary remarking on how peaceful it had been inside the chapel despite the crowds. People were so respectful, it was atmospheric. Rachel pondered Mishka's confessions and wondered if he had needed the religious experience in order to assuage his guilt, if he was the person who'd managed to tamper with the bread his late boss had eaten. It seemed odd that he would confess to thoughts of wanting to murder his boss, but she reasoned that he must feel safe because the death was an assumed accident, so he could enjoy the role play, even down to his pretend confession. Some murderers enjoyed the catch-me-if-you-can bravado following a killing. Could Mishka be the one they were looking for? She was determined to find out.